this episode of China Through Lines, I'm happy to welcome Mary A. Brazelton, who is the university lecturer in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at Cambridge University. And Mary has recently published a fantastic book called Mass Vaccination, Citizens, Bodies, and State Power in Modern China. And this book deals with a topic that is enormously timely, even though it covers primarily developments in the history of public health in China during the mid 20th century. But as I think you'll be able to gather from our conversation today, these are topics that have tremendous relevance to what is happening in China as well as in the wider world today. So um, we're very happy to have Mary join us for this conversation. And so Mary, I'd like to start off by asking you a question about how you see the topics that you cover in the book connecting with contemporary topics related to the coronavirus. So uh, to put it uh, you know, more specifically, what do you consider the most important ways in which the legacies of mid 20th century health campaigns, which are really the topics at the core of your book, and you deal specifically with vaccination, um, how do you see those developments influencing China's response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I just want to start by saying thank you also for those kind words about my book and for having me on uh, for this interview. Um, it's great to have a chance to talk to you. Um, but in response to that initial question, I think that there were th there have been three things that I've really noticed uh, emerging out of China's response to COVID-19 that really resonate with the kinds of things that I was researching for the book. Um, and the first of those, I think, is this concept of mass mobilization. Um, over the past few months, I think uh, the world's been inundated with photos of hospitals being built over the course of weeks in places like Wuhan. We've heard stories of massive and um, often quite uh, pressing quarantines, again, in places like Wuhan, but other major cities around China. And so mass mobilization is this kind of concept that's come up um, with respect to things like that, to campaigns like that, um, you know, organizations of lots of people to make these kinds of health interventions. And I think, you know, that very basic concept, it's quite broad, it's quite general, but that notion of getting a lot of people involved in projects of public health, that's something that I think really goes back to this crucial period in the mid 20th century that I look at in the book, uh, different ways in which even before the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, we see efforts on the part of the national state and regional governments to uh, enroll a lot of people in hygienic campaigns um, and especially campaigns of immunization. Um, and I think even drilling down a little bit to think about the nuances of things like these concepts of mass mobilization, you know, one of the things that's really interesting with the current situation with COVID is that it's not necessarily just about really forceful state interventions. Um, as people like Angela Lung have pointed out, um, we're also seeing in China's response to COVID a variety of other kinds of collective action, things like you know, non-governmental organizations uh, that are providing support to those in quarantine in different ways. Lung has pointed out that this too is something that has a much longer history of philanthropic intervention in health. Um, and I think that that's quite interesting. Also, when you think about questions of the relationship between mobilization and surveillance and record keeping, that too is quite interesting. Um, and the relationship between kind of voluntary action and coercion. So one of the really interesting stories that I've been following is the role of neighborhood committees in cities around China, the way in which neighborhood committee heads are keeping track of infected cases um, and travelers uh, on a very local level. Um, and that's really interesting to me in part because when I was doing research for this book on mass immunization in China, um, one of the stories that emerges out of that is that with the rise of mass immunization of populations in China, 
is the rise of record keeping, of the ability of the state to keep track of who's getting vaccinated against what disease, when and where. Um, so that's one kind of cluster of ideas, this notion of mass mobilization in different ways. Um, and so there are two others that I wanted to speak about a little bit more briefly. Um, the first is this notion of medical diplomacy. So I mentioned the way in which we get these photos of hospital construction, um, you know, moving around the world through news media. And that movement itself is kind of interesting to think about the ways in which uh, epidemic control in China is recognized, not just as a domestic matter, but also um, as something with an international dimension. Um, and that too was something that I found really interesting when I was doing the research for my book, the way in which you know, again, even before the establishment of the People's Republic, um, you know, during the Second World War, especially, we see a dazzling variety of international aid groups come to China, focus efforts on healthcare during the war with Japan. Uh, and then that over time developing into a variety of forms of medical diplomacy after the People's Republic of China uh, is established. And vaccines become tools of medical diplomacy in really interesting ways. Um, and healthcare itself, rural healthcare especially, um, and epidemic control um, as a part of rural healthcare um, becomes kind of this way in which China positions itself on a global stage over the course of the 60s and 70s, um, often through interventions in Africa, bringing medical teams filled with uh, vaccines and other kind of materials uh, of medical aid. Um, we see those uh, kinds of connections in medical diplomacy established during the Cold War period um, by China. Um, and those kinds of relationships, that notion of using medical aid as a means of cultivating political relationships, I think that resonates with some of the uh, things that we've seen over the past few months. So for example, the photo ops of Chinese medical teams arriving in Northern Italy with boxes of PPE. Um, you know, those, the framing of those pictures is actually really evocative of Chinese medical teams arriving in like Tanzania in the early 1960s. Uh, so there are lots of really interesting ways in which the importance of medical diplomacy and the international dimensions of epidemic control, I think, are quite um, interesting uh, and prominent. And so that's the second thing that I wanted to mention. Finally, the last thing that I think is absolutely fascinating is the way in which we see uh, the presentation of vaccination alongside other public health measures as a kind of technological solution to a crisis that um, has a lot of uh, varying social and political yeah. valences. Um, this notion that a COVID vaccine is going to kind of allow a hard reset um, and let us all return to normal life. In China, a COVID vaccine has been reported to have been tested already with the People's Liberation Army, um, and the military. Since July, again, it's been reported that the PRC has been giving selected key workers, people like border agents and health workers, um, one of the vaccines that's been developed um, and tentatively tested against COVID. Uh, furthermore, it's established agreements for international distribution of the vaccines that it manufactures. So again, we see that connection to diplomacy and the kind of broader international implications. And as somebody whose research looked at how in China in the mid 20th century, mass immunization appealed to health administrators as one strategy that stood out from other hygienic interventions um, as kind of vital to controlling epidemic disease, despite actually a variety of technical obstacles and issues with its uh, development and dissemination. It's kind of fascinating to see yet again, this presentation of vaccination as a technological solution that um, is, you know, sort of an, an answer to a lot of the problems that are emerging um, as a result of this pandemic outbreak. Um, so I think those kinds of three things, those questions of mass mobilization, of medical diplomacy, and this notion of a vaccine as a kind of savior, um, those are the three really interesting through lines or questions that, that have come up to me. Right, I mean, I think it's really amazing the way in which all of these topics that we read about in the news or hear about in coverage of COVID-19 appear in your book. And um, I think that people can really gain a better understanding 
um, as you've just explained of what's happening in terms of China's handling of COVID-19 through a reading of your book, which is, which is really, I think, a remarkable achievement. So one of the concepts that you use to tie all of these different topics together in your book is this notion of vaccines as biotechnical systems of political control. Now for um, some viewers, this might seem as if it's a somewhat difficult idea to get their heads around. Um, and so can you explain a little bit what you mean when you use that concept and perhaps give us some contemporary examples? Absolutely. So I think the idea that I'm trying to get at by using a term like this is the idea that vaccines can provide a means by which the state can intervene in the lives of its citizens. Um, and by intervene, I mean kind of make these sorts of interventions uh, with a variety of motivations, uh, typically to protect the public health um, in a meaningful way. By mandating vaccines um, or even recommending them simply, governments typically are making a connection between an individual state of immunity, something about their biological status, to their rights or freedoms or responsibilities as a citizen. So what might this look like in practice? Maybe requiring vaccines in order to travel from one place to another is an example of this kind of connection between you know, your state of immunity, um, your immune system, and the rights and responsibilities that you have. Um, and vaccine certificates being used as travel requirements are something that I trace over the course of the mid 20th century in China. Um, they become a really significant tool for um, implementing at border checkpoints um, within and outside China uh, from the mid 20th century going forward. But another example might be the requirements for children to have certain vaccinations in order to go to school or to enroll in school. Um, record keeping, again, that connects your vaccination status to um, other forms of documentation about your household. And this is something that I looked at with the case of China and household registers in the 1950s is another one of these connections between, again, individual bodily status and rights and responsibilities um, as citizens or subjects. And it's worth noting then that conversely, not that getting vaccinated, not having a vaccine can then become a problem. It can become a form of political resistance or evasion of the state in really interesting uh, ways. Um, and you know, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot when it comes to some of these questions is the concept of herd immunity, um, which has been in the news a lot lately. Uh, and I keep trying to think through it and my ideas are still pretty half formed, but um, it, I'm based in the UK. And so there were a lot of discussions back in March about the prospect of some sort of herd immunity strategy. And we saw this with the government of Sweden as well. Um, officials in Sweden sort of espoused the idea that, um, oh, well, if you just let COVID-19 travel through a population, um, you know, at a certain cost, um, in terms of people who might contract it and um, even pass away from it. Uh, that will happen, but then the population attains immunity against the disease in one way or another, and we can get back to business as usual. That's the idea. It's not actually re um, recognized, I think, in immunological or epidemiological circles. Um, herd immunity is actually a concept that you only use in reference to um, epidemics for which there's a vaccine. Um, but in this particular case, we have governments saying, um, well, we are asserting the power to manipulate a population's immune status by exposing them to a virus. Um, so there's this way in which, even in the absence of a vaccine, um, there's a way in which this notion that people's immune systems are something that the government can kind of involve itself in um, can manipulate in a way that will have certain economic or political effects. Um, that seems to be something that's been articulated by, you know, people in the UK, people in Sweden. Again, not really the context in which herd immunity is supposed to work, um, but 
I think there's something embedded in some of these discussions and conversations about herd immunity, suggesting connections between a certain style of government, certain economic configurations, um, and the health of a uh, national population. Um, so I'll just leave that there, but I think mm -hmm. it's an interesting and connected set of ideas to this kind of core connection between state power mm -hmm. and individual bodies. So the last thing that I wanted to ask you is related to one of the points that you drive home very strongly in your book, which is that China didn't simply absorb global developments in biomedicine. Rather, as you show quite clearly, China during the mid 20th century played a really important role in shaping global health policy, right? Um, and the question that I wanted to ask you, which I think is an important one, given the sort of anti-China sentiment that exists in the United States right now is how China is continuing to shape global health policy with specific re reference to COVID-19 and how you think that China will continue to shape global health policy in the future. So I think this is a fantastic question. And in some ways, I think it's not even really a question that China will, of course, continue to shape global mm. health policy. But how it does so, I think, is quite interesting to consider. I've talked already about medical diplomacy and the different ways in which we've seen China, as you, as you say, take leading roles in World Health Organization policymaking in variety of spaces of global health governance. Um, I think especially with the United States and the UK, perhaps not necessarily, and other kind of uh, nations around the world not necessarily taking on the leading role in kind of epidemic control. Um, I think we've already seen the PRC begin to reach out to um, nations uh, around the globe to um, do things like set up vaccine uh, supply contracts, um, offer medical aid in the form of PPE and other kinds of equipment and expertise. Um, and one of the things that was really striking early on in March and April um, was uh, the number of manuals that I was sent um, that kind of summarized Chinese experiences with COVID-19 as a means of offering aid to medical workers um, in other parts of the world. These manuals were translated into a number of different languages. So we see not only equipment in the form of PPE moving around the world, but also uh, knowledge, expertise, in different forms. Um, I think there are interesting questions around, for example, um, the promotion of Chinese medicine as a means of treating COVID-19. There are lots of questions about that, lots of ways in which the WHO has um, kind of endorsed, I think, uh, in some cases, um, or supported uh, Chinese responses um, that have involved kind of the question of Western and Chinese medicine working together um, in other ways, uh, that's still very much an open question, um, but that's something that I think will be quite interesting to watch. Um, so there are lots of ways in which this question of medical diplomacy, I think, and the international politics of global health are going to be um, worth watching in terms of uh, China's influence on that global stage. Um, but there are also other aspects of the question. So will this happen again and when and how? This is the second novel coronavirus to emerge in a Chinese context, um, the first being SARS in 2003, or SARS-CoV-1 as it's now being called. And the global economic processes that have been attributed with giving rise to COVID-19, things like the rise of industrial agriculture um, in China, often financed by transnational corporate finance groups, um, pushing smallholders to cultivate exotic wildlife and move to places that are closer to the reservoirs of uh, animal vectors of disease. Those kinds of dynamics don't seem to be going away, um, although you may know uh, more about the particular environmental history of, of some of these trends, um, but it seems as though those kinds of dynamics aren't necessarily being um, controlled or curbed uh, in a way that would 
that would halt the rise of a third or fourth coronavirus. Um, so there are all kinds of questions about that, questions that I think are even more pressing given what we know about epidemiology in China after SARS in 2003. Um, so Catherine Mason's work um, has looked at how after SARS, China reshaped its professional community of epidemiology, um, which was itself, you know, in 2003, epidemiology and kind of public health was already undergoing a series of institutional transformations. SARS kind of interrupted that and catalyzed um, a great deal of resource mobilization. Um, the result being that epidemiology in China after 2003 um, took a very aggressive approach to things like contact tracing, quarantine, the kinds of public health measures we've been seeing in full flush uh, over the past few months. Um, and yet, between 2003 and 2020, um, there have been some developments that I think are quite telling. So when swine flu broke out in 2009, um, the measures that the PRC took to control it um, were seen as overkill. The World Health Organization proclaimed China's actions of stringent quarantines and contact tracing to be basically unnecessary because swine flu turned out to be less lethal than had been predicted. Um, and so that was a case where, um, you know, the professional community of epidemiologists in China had reformulated their profession, their approach um, in a way that um, they thought was aligning with WHO norms and expectations, and yet they were criticized for the very actions that they thought would bring them into alignment with a global community and even kind of show them to be kind of excelling in this global community of epidemiology. Um, and so I think that is really interesting given kind of where we are today with COVID-19. Um, you know, even when epidemiologists in China are doing, are making this variety of interventions, are they still kind of subject to critique from uh, kind of WHO officials in ways that belie or that perhaps reflect um, attitudes to China more broadly? And this comes back to some of the things that you were um, saying about how we see this anti-China rhetoric emerging in um, the U.S. and other places in ways that um, is quite worrying. This apportioning of blame for the outbreak in ways that I think is quite damaging. So, you know, will China shape global health policy? I think that's certain. But in what ways and which populations and which leaders are going to be most receptive to those interventions? That, I think, is still very much an open question uh, and a developing question. Mm. Well, Mary, I, I just wanted to conclude by thanking you for joining us and for sharing all of your insights. I think that, you know, people who have the opportunity to view this interview and listen to what you have to say are going to come away with a completely different understanding of COVID-19 than they had before. And so, um, you know, all of your expertise, especially right now, is tremendously valuable and you know we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Oh well thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation.